actually, uh, to add to the last question, I hope, and it's just a comment. I remember 50 years ago, Bud Freed using the word dynamic linearity to me, which is exactly what it sounds like he was talking about. But my present question is more specific, just uh, limiting to base response. And I'll start it out by saying when I started, acoustic suspension and closed box dominated base design. Then Teal Small came around and we got base reflex, which now dominates base uh, design. And I happen to have a speaker that was designed to be both stuffed port and closed box. And I hear differences. And basically the closed box is better defined with less overhang. And yet the base reflex in a way is more alive, even though I know it's, oh, that, that there's more resonance there. And I just thought I'd, your comments on base design today. Well, that's a fabulous question, I have to tell you. Um, and it, it's a most interesting to discuss it. And I'll explain where I am. You design a box speaker and it's a particular volume and they're always smaller than you want because people want smaller speakers, not bigger speakers. So you've got a box volume and you've got a choice. Do you seal the box or do you vent it? If you vent it, it'll be, it could be three dB louder in terminal sensitivity. It could play three to five dB louder as well because the bass driver will not move as far on average with the port. So you've got those advantages ahead of you going ported. If you seal it, the coloration that comes out of the port is removed from the equation. The transient response is better because instead of being a fourth order design, a fourth order filter ringing, it's a second order filter. But of course, there are transitions between second and fourth order because you can adjust the damping. But nonetheless, that's the fundamentals. So I once took the view that the designer who said, I'm going reflex, wanted to make it louder for less money. Smaller magnet, less excursion, more bass, and the customer would like that. But if that bass is more colored, if it rings more, there's less detail, then he's getting shortchanged on quality. And it's up to the customer which he prefers. But it isn't as simple as that. There's a whole range of alignments which fit between overdamped sealed box and underdamped uh, vented box. And you can, you can play this any way you like. You can, you can play the design equation. It's up to the designer. Usually the designer tries to make the speaker as loud as possible and then the speak will be a bit boomy. But if he's prepared to sacrifice some sensitivity, then he can trade the reflex design to increase the power handling and to increase the base extension without the expense of uh, damping. It can still be reasonably well damped. So it's entirely up to the designer. It's, it's a moving target base reflex. Does that help? Yeah, uh, just a quick comment. I happen to have a like a five and a quarter cubic foot box with 18 inch whoopers. It's a custom design by a friend of mine who did some commercial designing. And my comparison base reflex versus closed box is sort of interesting because he designed the reflex to be a vessel function, which is a very hard thing to do, I gather, in a closed box. I think he did it by using passive equalization, by the way. But a vessel function is a very tight base reflex box. Has it got a hole in it? What? The box. Yes, and I, I can stuff it, it in a yeah, And he designed it that way because he was using a small room for himself and he was afraid it was going to overload the room. So he gave himself the option. Correct. I started out using the base reflex and I like it a lot. Then I switched to the port stuff box. I prefer the extra detail, but like I said, there's a lack of sort of life to the base reflex, to the closed box versus the vented box. It's a real trade-off. Um, what I've discovered is that skilled designers can play this one any way they like. And there are, there are some classic commercial speakers which are, are underdamped bass reflexes, and they boom at one note all the time, about 65 hertz, and they get on your nerves. They sound impressive in the showroom and then get on your nerves. And then there's some seal box speakers that need an awful lot of power. And because they need power to get bass extension because they've got high moving mass, they absorb that power and then they compress. You've got thermal compression 
and they're not as lively, not as exciting. So there's this eternal conflict between liveness and efficiency and bounce and control and low coloration, um, but perhaps um, some compression, some lack of excitement. Um, for, the, for smaller speakers, I suspect they should be bass reflex. I suspect for big speakers, I mean, if you've got, if you've got the space for two 10 inch bass and they're not huge by your standards, but for me they are, two 10 inch bass is a channel seal box. That's the alignment which gives me the most detail and the best damping in my room. So I'd vote for seal box at 60 to 80 litre boxes um, with two tens, tens aside. But you never know, somebody might come along. That's the surprise about reviewing. People come along with designs and they, they say, you're wrong, you got the last one wrong. I'm showing you how to do it differently. And that's half the fun of it. Um, the Karl Heinz Fink speaker is a bass reflex. And I did not expect to find the quality of bass that it produces. And it's a very, very careful alignment. It's, it's a stagger tuned alignment with a very slow slope. So it's using the reflex to improve the power handling, but not to extend the power of the frequency response. That reminds, that, reminds that's, me. It's reflex, but it sounds like a seal box. It's timing is that of a seal box. It reminds me of a Rockport speaker that was tested in stereophile where the designer claims he rolls at 12 dBs per octave. And he told me to look up the stereophile test and damned if it didn't roll at 12 dBs from 40 down to 20. And I suspect what he did was design the port to essentially be flat for almost an octave, but then below 20, it does switch to 24 dBs per octave. But the important part probably is that last octave from 20 to 40. So it, it sounds, and I've heard Rockport speakers and they are very tight for a bass reflex. No, I, think, I think he's got it right. He, he has the, uh, the advantage of lots of money in a big box. And uh, yes. when you can spend money and you've got a big box and a lot of magnet, you can play tunes in the bass. And it's clear that the, the, for most houses, well, certainly European houses, there's increasing bass lift below 60 Hertz. Perhaps not so much in large American houses. And you, yeah, and you, you, you'll get boomy bass from a lot of large American reflexes. Um, the American manufacturers that sell in England have to work really hard to make sure their products are compatible. And some of them have tuning devices in the bass. So many of the Wilsons have a, a damping resistor that's available under the patch, cap, patch panel underneath, which it increases the damping in the low frequency alignment. And, and many, many speakers are set to that for, for UK use. I think if you if you could did see the stereophile test, what's very interesting, of course, is that John shows the response of the driver and the port. And what's most interesting about the port is most ports, of course, are peaked. This port looks almost flat for that one octave. Yes. As if the bandpass designed yes. port reinforcing the box itself. Well, as a, as a band pass, it will have less phase shift as well. It will, will have a broader phase, phase region for integrating with the main driver. I mean, the, the, the teal small equations were wonderful for us because they allowed us to manipulate the base response in most exciting ways, um, changing masses and changing damping. You can really get any base re response you want now with modeling. And uh, obviously, he's using that, those techniques to effect. All right, thanks for the question, Alan. And uh, Pete, thank you for raising your hand. You can take it away. Uh, when I uh, started in audio as a young child, um, it was early enough that it was mono. And when we switched to stereo, I said, the focus of the most recordings is in the center. And how are two speakers going to provide this um, center image? Or I guess they call it a phantom center. Uh, do you find that there's something in a pair of speakers uh, that's required to get a good phantom center? Because I find many systems don't actually uh, provide it very well. In, in general, some of the tricks that you can use or techniques you can use, you need to curve the sides of the enclosure because a sharp edge, a furniture edge to a speaker provides a point of diffraction and there's uh, radiating, almost circular, the radiating wavefronts that are re-radiated -re from the edges. And you can hear those as an interference 
in the coherence of the, the first arrival. You can, you can ameliorate that to some degree by tipping the speaker inward. So you're trying to adjust the angle to the ear where there's a kind of sweet spot where you get best focus. And that would be a point of least perturbation of the off-axis, horizontal off-axis response. Um, it, it's a difficult problem. Uh, for example, if you get a, a mono recording, um, try not to listen to it in stereo, it sounds wrong. Put, put it to one speaker only and turn your chair to face that speaker and you'll hear a better sound from the mono recording than the two speakers trying to produce the, the, the mono, mono channel in the center. I did that with the Wilson, but we listened to some very early mono recordings from EMI, and they were more musical, played on one speaker only. I also find if you move your head back and forth, uh, it sounds like the image is going to one speaker and then to the other, and I find it very distracting. Is this on stereo? Yes, yes. The, the, the speaker, it suggests the speaker is suffering from some edge diffraction and its response is changing more rapidly with small head movements than you would like. And the speakers that have more curved set sides and better integration with the drivers, you can get some which have almost no variation over plus or minus 10 degrees of, of lateral movement. And those are more stable in their stereo imaging. We're talking about stereo image stability here and coherence. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Dave Schwartz, you raised your hand next. Go ahead. I'm curious as to what your thoughts are as to digital signal processing in the design of speakers, such as in the CAF LS50 wireless or uh, the key three speakers. I think that the advantages of total manipulation, I use a kind word, perhaps an unkind word, manipulation of signals, it gives the designer great freedom to fix faults that would otherwise be intractable. Um, he can get at the drivers, the intrinsic driver transfer function and correct for it in advance. He can correct for time delays. So there are potential benefits to fully digital loudspeakers. And I've heard those benefits and I think the KII is ex exceptional. And I think the KEF speakers do a very good job at their price level. It's a triumph of mass production uh, over technology. The technology really is embedded in mass production to deliver something that's really very sophisticated. Um, of course, when you've got um, power supplies, electronic power supplies and switching amplifiers, um, there is some level of interference traveling around the box. And there's, there's something just slightly veiled or slightly obstructed about them. They don't quite punch you in the guts, if you like. The, 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 the linear amplifiers with passive loudspeakers, for me, go a little extra in terms of dynamic impact and resolution. But these speakers have great value and do a great deal for, what the, for their size and price. I think they're fine performances, but um, there, are, there are limitations to what they do. They're not perfect. Danko, take it away. Unmute yourself. I have a question about um, two trends that are now happening. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. The two trends that are now happening in uh, speaker design. Basically, you have a lot of inexpensive speakers, especially active which are designed to measure very well, to correspond to something they call Harman objectivity score. And basically for the public that likes these speakers and buys them, the audio, audio, audio files are becoming a laughing stock because we're buying these expensive speakers that very often don't measure very well. And also in testing this equipment, these objectivists usually listen only one speaker. Anyway, my question to you is, uh, is the linearity of speakers now falling out of favor? Because recently I was looking to some hi-fi news and record review speaker reviews, and I see a lot of measurements, and I see like huge variations, like a plus minus eight decibels, and for some pretty large speakers and expensive ones, and practically no comment in the listening section about it, or even in the lab review. So basically my question is, do, do you think that speakers, the linearity is not as important today? It's more like the impression the speaker will make, musicality, does it sound live? And we're talking about, some, to some degree, the approach of some reviewers to measuring and interpreting what they measure. Yeah, because um, there's like a young audiophiles, if you want to have younger people audiophiles, a lot of them get uh, influenced by these objectivists 
because they they say that every speaker can be objectively assessed and you know the listening is not really the key way to determine the quality but but they're obviously incorrect in this belief but they're so confident in their own abilities to measure something they believe the measurements that speakers will sound like an amplifier measures uh, and even they don't even they don't even listen to amplifiers for example they they measure only something they called SINAD that's all they yeah. measure and they don't listen at all because they assume that all amplifiers and especially digital tunnel converters they all sound the same so they don't really measure and no, then I, I can't live in that world but I can give you a parallel when I started reviewing for hi-fi news I was reviewing amplifiers and it was routine for me to listen to the amplifier and comment on how it sounded my editor at the time before John Atkinson's time, said that all amplifiers sounded the same if they measured well, and I was not to speak about how they sounded. <laughs> I was censored. And that's why I left that magazine at that stage, because I wasn't allowed to, to describe what I could hear at home with the speakers I was using. So there, there, those people exist. They're, they're, they're the deniers in this world, and we just have to leave them, leave them behind us. They're no use to us at all. We've got to keep an open mind. Well, what happened to them is they reviewed the Wilson tune dot speaker, which had bad measurements, but very good subjective assessment in sound. So it was recommended. And then all hell broke loose in the forums. It was like an unbelievable response. Basically, they attacked the viewer that he is like a traitor to their cause that speaker can sound good if it measures like that. It's really interesting. Sounds like the anti-vaxxers to me. Yeah, the, the, the website is uh, Audio Science Review. That's the website. Yeah, they're a strange lot in my view. Yeah. <laughs> they, so they, they, don't, about they don't do enough listening. They, they so the measurement is the holy grail of all that they do. And they really don't listen in a, in a dispassionate manner and, and feel the emotional response that you can make to music when it's reproduced well on equipment where designers know how to make music. It's as simple as that. But, and I have another question, maybe more just like a compliment. I have one of the most amazing publications I've mm -hmm. ever seen. It's a hi-fi choice. Cartridges and headphones recommended booklet. So my question to you is how in 1980 you were able to test hundreds of cartridges with such detailed lab tests and measurements and needle microscope examination and headphones. How was it possible to do it, you know, 40 years ago? I was, I was not alone. <laughs> I, had, <laughs> I had a team. Hi -fi, Hi Fi Choice had a budget. It was a successful magazine. And we did four issues a year. And we had, at that time, many thousands of pounds of research budget. And I had a team of people working with me who set up turntables who set up cartridges. I had an expert in, in diamond styli, and he did, did electron micro, microscopy on every cartridge. He got into a lot of trouble for that because a very famous American manufacturer was using low-grade diamonds, and nobody knew. And we, we looked at his diamonds, and they were rough. And he said, no, they're not rough. And he came to see me, and we showed him our expert evidence, and they went back home. Wow. We, wor we worked very hard on the, on the hi-fi choice is extremely hard. And we did lots of blind listening tests. And when you get two or two, uh, 20 or 30 things at once, and you work on them for months, you learn all their differences, all their relationships, all the subtleties of sound from their design, their construction, and how they, how they loaded. And you, know, you, you become a master of the art temporarily until you go on to the next subject, which might be amplifiers or loudspeakers. You devote yourself for months to getting it right. Just thank you. Fascinating Thanks, to see. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And uh, it's starting to get a, uh, a bit late. We still have some questions to go through, though. So um, I do want to give uh, everyone a chance to ask their questions. Charlie, would you like to uh, take it away? Yes. I wanted to thank you again, Martin, for all your time today. And uh, really, really appreciate all your feedback. I, I, have, I have one simple question or one complex question, I guess, depending on your point of view. Um, I, since I don't have ready access to 
a lot of acoustic live performances. I use loudspeakers as a reference. And, and the two speakers I use, interestingly enough, are the key threes, which you I had discussed previously, and the latest variant of the Linkwitz loudspeaker, the LX521.4, with the analog crossovers this time, not the digital ones, and, and his latest uh, magnesium cone lower mid driver, which is a marvelous, marvelous driver. Do you, is that a valid concept of using a loudspeaker as a reference source as opposed to an acoustic source, being it's in, in the, the same room um, as the room that is being designed in? And um, so would experience similar distortions. Is it, so is it a valid concept to use a loudspeaker as a reference? I think not instinctively. Loudspeakers are so imperfect compared with reality. The idea of using them as the intermediate reference is a worry. Um, you can get certain loudspeakers which under limited conditions will reproduce speech very accurately and have good directivity. They're not hi-fi speakers, but they're, they're fairly close to speech if you were to do an AB, for example, in an anechoic chamber. And they're used in limited applications, but for hi-fi, for broad range, I think the inconsistencies and inaccuracies in any loudspeaker design would make it uh, worrying to use it as a as a li effectively live live source reference. I'd worry about it. And I'm not referring to a, 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 the classic AB reference, but rather as an analog to a live performance, because live performances are so widely separated from the, the loudspeaker design experience in time. At, at best, you know, a whole day, at least. But if you were using it as a reference in your design, you would try and remove the errors in the reference. The, the real thing is the only thing you can go back to. I, I suppose that's true. I and often use voice in, in design as well. I use a live, live recording of voice as, as a, as a, as a, as a I mean, reference. It, it's reference. certainly true that every speaker designer has some favorite speakers lying about and he will keep picking them up and trying them and comparing what he's doing with them to see how far he's got, whether he's making progress. But it, they're so far from reality, it's a bit worrying. You, you have to play music that you know well and go back to that and try and divorce yourself from other references because they will cloud your judgment. Uh, Alan, go ahead. Since you were just, well, relatively recently uh, testing the XVX, I'm sort of curious about your reaction to the precise time alignment that's involved there and how much effect it gets. Because it sort of seemed to me, well, I go back to when linear phase was temporarily uh, very popular and that needed the linear phase crossovers and time alignment. But you don't have to do, you can do one or the other. And it seemed to me that time alignment might be more important because you're using two drivers to play the same tone at the same level at the exact crossover. And if they're off, that could muddle the sound. Does that make sense? Well, you've given me an idea in interpreting the XVX. So I'm grateful to you for that. Just mm -hmm. thinking about the XVX, if you have a, pl a flat baffle and you're putting drivers on it, the, the rival or the, the start points for the voice calls are all di different distances from the front panel. The XVX has the advantage of being able to move all of the separate driver units in their own boxes. So you can achieve a degree of coherence in the, in the radiated wavefront, which you can't when they're stuck on one baffle. And so because Wilson decided to allow the, all the, these boxes to be movable um, fore and aft, once you can start doing that, you can play with it. And there are centers where they come into focus really extraordinarily well, much better than if they're all in a straight line. So I think it, it's a strange bonus that they've acquired. I don't think they quite knew it was going to happen, but when they incorporated the feature and called it time alignment, Strictly, it doesn't make it linear phase or, or lin linear time aligned, but it seems to provide a coherence of the arrivals of the drivers that you have in their enclosures in a way that magnifies the focus substantially. I mean, it, it, is, it is an assault on the senses, the XVX. The wavefront that arrives, the speaker just disappears. You've got this amazing sound stage, which is palpably solid. It really is a structure out there. And whatever recording you play, it somehow plays through that. It delivers more of what you know on the recording. It's more like listening to headphones, but presented in a stereo manner. 
Very few speakers give you the immediacy of headphones. They can do very well, and I like them. And I won't, won't stop listening to, to loud speakers. It's my favorite. But that, that particular immediacy you get with headphones, well, the XVX delivered some of that at the listening seat, and it was quite uncanny. And, and if you move those boxes around, it went away. There was a sweet spot for the, for the fore and after alignment of each one of the parts of that speaker. And I think David clocked onto that early. Most of his high-end speakers have had that adjustability. And we've always used it when they're installed in, in, on site for listening. Well, I think it's, it's something interesting. Well, his first speaker was the Wham, which had that. Correct. Ability. And I think- And then the Grand Slam. Yeah, but, and I think he got the idea, although not the adjustability, that was his idea, from the dock was DQ10, which moved yes, back, back and forth. Absolutely right. Yeah, he, he realized that you could you could separate things and move them about and get and get their, their their starting point, their time starting point in alignment at the listening position. And there was an extra degree of realism and transient accuracy when you achieved that. And it sounds it sounds like you haven't heard that extra magic from any other form of loudspeaker design. That adjustability is necessary. Am I jumping to a conclusion? You're probably jumping to a conclusion. There are many ways of making good. I can see John's cat now. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping him warm. It's cold in Brooklyn. That's the thing. No, seriously. Um, there are many ways of skinning the loudspeaker cat. And Magico have one way of doing it. And Wilson have another. But I, I'd not heard the Wilson alignment feature have such an effect on me as this speaker did. It was very immediate. You, you closed your eyes and you felt the images were solid. There were real people on stage singing at you. It, it, it was uncanny. I saw the term used in another review of it called physicality, as if you can almost reach out and touch the singer or the instrument. I, I think that I think that's fair. You close your eyes, and and you really were transported to the sound stage where that performance was occurring. And and it did it for classical. It did for a big space. Did for an orchestra and piano in Japan. It did it for Fleetwood Mac, and not a brilliant recording um, of many years ago, 70s. It did it for all records that I knew well. It just, every, every recording I knew really well was a surprise on it. It suddenly jumped out with more, more musicality, more performance quality, more dynamics, more focus, particularly more focus. As an engineer, I didn't expect a, a crowd of boxes in a pile, stacked, stacked with wings ahead, to create a focus of that quality, but it really did. It, it confounded some of my preconceptions. Mm -hmm. But you've heard Wilson adjustable speakers before. It sounds like they never quite did this. Until they weren't they as good as this one. They were good for their time. And I, I may not have heard all the, all the most expensive ones. This is one of the most expensive I've heard. Yeah. But it, it delivered. Somehow the cones were good now. The tweeters were sweet. You know, everything was in place. OK. Here's Thanks, Alan. Uh, a lot uh, of dollars. Alan, uh, we're going to, uh, great questions, but it's getting late, so I want to move on. Um, uh, we have Pete uh, and then uh, John Atkinson and Mike and uh, a few more questions. So let's uh, keep it moving. Thanks. Uh, Pete, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you have a favorite uh, transmission line base loaded speaker. Uh, modern or vintage? Um, and if not, maybe your opinion on them? I think my answer is no. I don't have a favorite one. Have you got Are them? they all flawed or? Uh... I, they, it's wrong to say they're flawed. I, I'm not sure about the idea of, of a long line of air floating around more or less on its own uh, down a long pipe. And the very big ones I think are good, the big PMCs are very agile and good, but I, I find some of the smaller ones, that the, the, there's an upper pipe mode in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the line, which you can hear. The lower mid range is a bit colored, it can sound boxy. Conversely, they can be more dynamic and have more bass extension for the size, you take your pick with it. I think they need to be big and well damped, but I think uh, some of the, the AES experts on this have looked at the, the modeling of the big transmission lines, and they took the view that the very big ones, when they were damped well enough, not to have a, an overhang or resonance, they were no better than a seal box, either in efficiency or base extension. So I, I think designers will use every technique they can in a given size and price. 
And there's lots of solutions to the, these problems. Thank right, you. Great. Thanks. Yeah, we had uh, Peter Thomas uh, as a guest last year, but unfortunately, um, he his U.S. Uh, he had lost a U.S. distributor, and so except for his professional line, uh, I don't know that any of us have had a chance to hear the PMC speakers, but we look forward to that. Uh, anyway, uh, John, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, I mean, oh, excuse me, the cat, <laughs> the cat's reminding me that it's getting near dinner time. Um, mentioning hi-fi choice reminded me that I wanted to thank Martin for teaching me to listen. I he invited me to be a panelist on all the single blind loudspeaker listening tests for Hi-Fi Choice. And taking part in those tests was an education in how to listen, what to listen for. I remember Martin saying, listen to that, that's cone cry. And he's talking about a paper, paper cone breaking up with the coloration that that induces. And it was an education. And I you know, just wanna say, thank you, Martin. And, Thank you, John. Um, yeah. And the other thing is on the Wilson speakers, if you read the Wilson publicity, they imply that the speakers are time coincident, like a Quad ESL 63, in that all the output at all frequencies arrives at the same time, except it doesn't, because they have a, a traditional crossover, I think it's second order between tweeter and midrange, where the tweeter is in connected inverted polarity to the mid-range. But with the fine tuning that they do, it appears that the, the speaker is, it may not be time coincident, but it's time coherent. And I think, is that what you're talking about, Martin? I, th I think that's true. And you're absolutely right about uh, being linear, linear phase or in, in absolute time, they're not. There's something about the focusing of the wave fronts of their arrival at the listener that produces an extra performance boost and that they've mastered. And I, I don't think it's entirely susceptible to analysis. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Uh, Michael Ellis, uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Martin, thank you for the presentation, very, very informative. Um, the question I have is, uh, do you have any experience with digital crossovers versus uh, passive crossovers? And you know, full disclosure, uh, we're a very small speaker company and we do use digital crossovers, but uh, we're always uh, eager to learn. So I'm just curious if you have experience with digital crossovers uh, in direct comparison to um, conventional passive crossovers. And uh, we do not use, um, we've designed them to be used with um, anybody's amplifiers, whether they be uh, class A tube amplifiers or AB solid state or whatever. So I'm really just speaking to the actual crossovers. Well, potentially that's a very deep question, but I'd comment, I don't think there's an intrinsic difference between digital and analog processing if both are handled well. I think digital crossovers can be more accurate, more versatile and better equalized than analog crossovers because the level of potential complexity is much higher. So you can address faults that you can't address otherwise. The issues are to do with uh, any noise, high frequency noise, radio frequency noise, digital power supply noise, which might get onto the analog amplification following the crossover. So you need very clean filtering, um, very good ground practice. You need to suss around with a sniffer, RF sniffer, to make sure that you're not polluting the local environment, which could take away some of the quality that you're, you're trying to create. It's easy in analog, it, 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 analog bits just join up and they rarely upset each other. But if you put digital into an analog chain, you can upset it. And we did that when we first started with digital replay and with digital DAX. We've learned to filter them better, to filter their power supplies better, to ground them better, to shield them better, to shield their power supply cables. And if you pay attention to detail and set a high standard to begin with and fight for it, you'll solve those problems. I see no reason why you can't make a good digital crossover loudspeaker. Do you, do you feel there's any inherent advantages other than uh, what you just, just, just described? Uh, well, the you can, yeah, the fact that you can build in, e sorry, I'll wait for you. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, you can build in equalization for each drive unit. You can measure each drive unit, pre-correct it. So there's an extraordinary versatility available with a high order filter. 
which in the key I speaker they exploit. So uh, the key I speaker is a remarkable object and I would, would never criticize it uh, on a performance basis. It's a very good sounding speaker and a very clever speaker. Yeah, the reason I, one of the reasons I asked is, you know, your expertise, but uh, when we present our, our products to people, you know, often they uh, speak very highly of it. And then when they understand we're using digital crossovers, they seem to have a different look on their face as though this is a, uh, a negative aspect or a big elephant in the room. And, and they, uh, it's just the perception that, you know, we're, we're facing is, is uh, kind of interesting. Um, and by the way, I believe um, the uh, arrival time of what you're describing, the Wilsons, is very important, as is uh, really excellent dynamic you know, capabilities. Those are things we strive for. But, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just tr trying to learn from you, like, how do you express to people that a digital crossover is not an evil thing? <laughs> well, you have to explain the techniques that you're using to combat yeah. previous historic problems and, mm -hmm. and, and admit to those problems and, and explain how you've dealt with them, how you believe you're dealing with them and prove by example. Mm -hmm. Keep fighting. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting uh, point that... Um, you know, we're dealing with, but uh, we feel that the dig digital crossovers have allowed us to design our speakers the way they are designed. And, and we do appreciate their uh, ability to fine tune, but um, not everybody seems to be uh, open to that. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Um, and as you say, people like the sound. So the proof is that your speakers sound good. So. <laughs> and, uh, John Bratton, go ahead. Thanks. Hey, Martin, thank you for your time. Very informative. Um, my question deals with subwoofers, especially uh, multiple, two or more, with speakers. Um, in your experience, uh, and assuming the room can handle the loading, um, in your experience, do, does the performance of most any kind of speaker always benefit from the use of say multiple subwoofers or should one be much more selective this speaker maybe that speaker but not some other speaker that's a very big question indeed because there's so many possible combinations um subwoofers are helpful to smaller speakers without any doubt and distributing bass in a room will contribute to more even bass response and better more tuneful bass the problem is getting the integration with the main speaker and the additional power supplies and cabling, uh, the, the infrastructure required, is that going to get in the way of the, the purest performance of the main stereo pair? If you get the main stereo pair to communicate with you well, you might have to sacrifice a little bit of bass because if you go for the objective of having deep bass in the same space, you might begin to disturb the balance that you've achieved with the main stereo pair. In other words, it's better to have it slightly constrained than to go for, go for bust and upset the whole thing. Now, if you're going to put subwoofers in, ideally you want moderately large ones, not huge, and several of them distributed. But each time you do this, you're adding more power supplies, more cables, more audio cables stuck on the audio feed. So that there is a possibility that you'll detract from the performance of the main pair in a purest sense. It depends on what your objectives are. This will be the last question, uh, Bob uh, Grossman. It's uh, it's getting late, and I want to I want to let Martin go. But uh, go ahead, uh, Bob, and ask your question. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm and reiterate exactly what Martin described about the role and use of subwoofers, uh, because I've had them in and out of my system for many years, and uh, they provide an extra foundation or fundamental uh, frequency response to the sound, which which I posted a, uh, a chat about earlier that, that to me adds a sense of the acoustical space uh, and ambience of the room. But the trade-off that uh, it has to be very carefully accomplished is, is, is exactly as, as Martin said, uh, the extra cabling, the crossovers, and the bleeding of the subwoofers into the upper registers because of the overtones uh, can come at a detrimental loss to the quality and uh, quality, the purity of, of your main speakers. Well, thank you. I wanted to really uh, acknowledge the great meeting that uh, was unfortunately delayed and uh, to finally get to hear uh, and meet uh, Martin 
the uh, the Zoom call was 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 terrific. I've read his uh, his his writings for many years. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so, Martin, I'll let you go. Uh, this was a great meeting. Um, I was very depressed when it started because of the Zoom bombing that we had to endure, uh, which I hadn't experienced before. I assure everybody uh, in the meeting here that I'll change my security preferences in the future. And I'm sorry you had to go on so late, um, but you were very generous with your time and it was a great meeting. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. I really enjoy the questions.